Um, so our last speaker is Dr. Bridget Williams. There's Bridget. Um, so Bridget will be um, discussing, uh, her title is Advancing Plant Conservation with Genetic and Epigenic Tools, a Case Study of the Federally Threatened Kentucky Glade Crest. Um, and Kentucky Glade Crest is a federally listed plant here in Kentucky. Um, I worked with uh, uh, Bridget's um, uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Christy Edwards um, on the field work for this project and, and, they, and their lab does a lot of uh, collaborative projects with several of the federally listed plants in Kentucky. So I'm super excited. We don't have many talks on conservation genetics. So I'm super excited uh, to hear your talk, Bridget, and see what the results are of, of a Kentucky project are. So take it away, Bridget. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Sometimes the just somebody let me know if uh, the volume goes out <laughs> while I'm giving a presentation. Sometimes the the computer that I'm on is a little weird about it. Okay. Just get to it. Okay. Um, thanks so much for that introduction, Tara. So today the the projects that I'm going to be talking about were part of the work that I conducted as a PhD student at St. Louis University where I was co-advised by Dr. Christy Edwards um, here at the garden. And um, I left for a postdoc and now I've, I've been lucky enough to come back um, and do a postdoc with her. So I'm really excited to, to update you guys on the work that we've done. It's a, it's a pretty cool system and we found some really interesting, um, some interesting things. So. so first of all, I just wanna get everybody kind of thinking um, on, you know, a, kind of frame what the talk is going to be about. And so I first want to cover what the conservation genetics paradigm is. Um, this focuses typically on small populations of organisms in our case plants. Um, and those small populations are typically characterized by low genetic diversity. And the reason that we're interested in these small populations with low genetic diversity is because that low genetic diversity leaves them susceptible to factors that can further lower their genetic diversity things like population bottlenecks, genetic drift, and inbreeding depression. And this can lead to the loss of adaptive genetic variation, which reduces their capacity to adapt. And so it's based on um, this chain of events that theory predicts that this leaves them at an increased risk of extinction. So a major goal of conservation genetics then is to protect the capacity of organisms to adapt by conserving variation on which selection can act in order to drive adaptation. And something that I'm really interested in personally is our species with low genetic diversity doomed to extinction. Um, okay, so now I wanna introduce you to our study system. This is the genus of Levenworthia. It's in the family um, Brassicaceae. It's comprised of eight species of small winter annuals and they're adaphic endemics. So they're all adapted to limestone glades and glade-like open habitats with those rocky shallow calcareous um, soils. And it's also a model for studying the evolution of mating system because there's a lot of diversity going on in this um, genus with mating systems. So we have five species that are known to be self-compatible, two species that um, present mixed mating systems, meaning that they can self-fertilize and cross-fertilize. And then we also have one species that's been confirmed to be self-incompatible. Interestingly, we also have three of these species that are self-compatible that have been listed as endangered or threatened in at least a portion of their ranges. And so today we're mostly interested in um, Levomorthia exitua um, species. So this is a poorly known species, um, but we do know that it's distributed throughout Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, and northern Georgia, and it's been further divided into three varieties. So over here on the left, um, this is Levenworthia exitua, uh, variety exitua, which is identifiable by white petals and lavender sepals. And it's um, found in Tennessee and North Georgia. Then we have Levenworthia exitua varludia, um, and it's identifiable by yellow petals, and it's only found in Alabama. And then um, finally, the star of today's talk is Levenworthia exitua varlicineata, which is identifiable by white petals and green sepals, and it is only found in Kentucky. So this is the one that we're focused on today. So Levenworthy exitua varlicineata is narrowly restricted to only two counties in Kentucky. It has a, a very narrow range. Um, and that range is located directly south of Louisville in an area that's undergoing a lot of residential and commercial development. 
Over half of remaining populations have experienced serious declines and many have been lost or extirpated. And it was recently listed as threatened under the US Endangered Species Act. But there's a lot that we don't know about the system um, genetically. And so it, it was really important to kind of get an idea of what was going on with the genetic diversity to try to estimate its adaptive capacity and, and to better inform conservation management decisions. And so the study design for um, the conservation genetics portion of, of this work focused on Levomorthia exigua var exigua um, and then Levomorthia exigua var lysineata. And so I've kind of listed out here just briefly, um, again, you know, exigua exigua is found in Tennessee and Northern Georgia versus the very narrow ranging exigua lysineata in just two, Kentucky, in two counties in Kentucky. Um, exigua var exigua has been shown to be self-fertilizing, but we weren't really sure exactly what the mating system of exigua variety lysineata was. Um, so we thought that it could be self-fertilizing, but that was something that we, we wanted to test. Um, and so we sampled six populations of exigua var exigua for a total of about 136 individuals. And we sampled um, 21 populations of exigua lysineata. And the reason for that is because we really just needed a handful of populations of exigua var exigua against which we could compare genetic diversity metrics in lysineata too. Um, and then we used um, a, a panel, a final panel of 16 microsatellite markers that were selected based on whether or not they exhibited two or more um, genetic vari or gene variations or alleles. Um, and we identified these um, as being the most variable in exigua var exigua with the idea that if there is, um, if these are the most variable markers, then we should see some variation. So we really tried to isolate um, the most genetic variation that we could in this, this system in order to try to determine how much genetic diversity we could detect um, in this, this narrow ranging species. And so we were interested um, in, in identifying um, or um, understanding the genetic diversity and structure or the distribution of genetic diversity within and among populations of exigua var lysineata. And then we also wanted to know whether it was genetically distinct from exigua var exigua, um, because that will also affect how it's managed. If it turned out that it was just um, a you know, kind of disparate population or disrupt populations of exigua var exigua, then maybe it doesn't need as much attention to protect. Um, and so it was, it was really important to determine both of those things. Um, we also, because we expect that exigua var exigua is self-fertilizing, um, or, or we know that, then we use that to compare lysineata against, because we would expect similar patterns of genetic diversity um, if it was also a self-fertilizing system. And so I just want to jump right in um, and show you some of our results, because I have a, a lot to get through um, in this talk. And so we use those microsatellite markers um, to look at genetic diversity uh, within exigua exigua and exigua lysineata. And interestingly, um, what we found, so this, this table shows the um, partitioning of genetic variation um, among populations, among individuals within populations, as well as individuals. So we're looking at multiple scales of genetic diversity in each of these species. And what we see here is that 20% um, of all of the genetic vari variation that was measured or detected was found um, among populations, whereas essentially 0% was found among individuals within populations. And so what that means is that all of the individuals of exigua var lysineata within a population essentially are genetically identical. And then we found 80%, so the vast majority of genetic diversity that we detected in this species was found within individuals. So that means that heterozygosity, they, they, have, a lot of, um, they have a lot of alleles um, with, you know, packaged within individuals. But again, these individuals are identical within a population. So that's a really interesting pattern and does not reflect what we would have expected to see um, if this was a self-fertilizing system. We also observed in this system um, that observed heterozygosity was greater than expected at some loci um, within this species such that there was even fixed heterozygosity, which does not make sense for a self-fertilizing plant. Um, you would expect that that genetic diversity within an individual would be further and further eliminated. And instead we saw that it was, um, it was pretty substantial. Uh, I think it was like 
eight or 10 of the microsatellite markers that we used reflected um, some kind of fixed heterozygosity at those loci. So that was really weird. Um, and, and then um, beyond that, whenever we look at what we found in exigua or exigua among populations, this is where we see the most genetic diversity partitioned in this species at 50, roughly 55, 56%. Among individuals, we see um, about 13% of variation. So we do see um, genetic variation between individuals within a population, whereas we didn't see any over um, in this species. And then within individuals, there is about 30%. So we have like individual levels of heterozygosity are much lower um, than what we observed in that in the very rare and endangered species. And so this, this pattern where we see most genetic diversity um, partitioned among populations is much more along the lines of what you expect whenever you have a self-fertilizing system. Um, and so that that was definitely a, a big indicator that the Levenworthy exigua of Arlesineata is very unlikely to be a self-fertilizing um, plant. And so um, next, what we looked at, this is maybe a little bit easier to see um, than a table, is genetic structure within and among the populations of both of these species. And so what you see here, this is called a, a structure diagram. And what you see here is um, that these blue, the, or excuse me, the colors represent genetic clusters um, to which each individual has been assigned. So um, it's really hard to tell because there's such a solid block of blue here, but all of these blue, there are um, kind of individual lines you might be able to see over here in um, the exigua 4 population, each one of those lines indicates a genetic individual that was included in the study. So this large blue block represents 440 individuals that we genotyped in this study. They're all just so genetically identical that um, it's hard to tell that they're individuals. And each one of these um, bigger blocks represents a population. And so then the red over here represents the um, six populations of exigua. And you can see that there is some genetic diversity. It's largely uh, contained within exigua four. And so it, the, the blue indicates that there is some genetic similarity to what we saw in um, exigua lucinida, uh, which is not entirely unexpected since this exigua var lucinida has been classified as um, a variety of the Levenworthy exigua um, species. And I also want to point out, um, we ran, uh, we also did an analysis of clonality. And interestingly, um, in exigua of Arlis and Yeda, I, that they were all assigned to a single clone. There was only one genotype. So um, again, that's very, very strange and not at all what we would expect to see in um, a self-fertilizing system. And so um, this, is, uh, this is known as a heat map. And so what we're looking at here is warm colors um, represent uh, greater genetic similarity and cool colors represent um, less genetic similarity. And so I, I hope you can tell um, we've kind of divided up each one of these lines indicates an individual um, that was genotyped in the study. And so we've got all of our exigua lucinated individuals are clustered um, together and all of our exigua, exigua individuals are clustered together. And what you basically the, the, the message or the take home from this image is that um, we see a lot of very strong genetic similarity again among these exigua varlis and yeta individuals where we see um, a lot of the, the red coloration um, and warmer colors versus in exigua exigua. Um, it's much predominantly cooler colors. And also you might notice there is zero genetic similarity um, found between the Lysinida individuals and um, the exigua exigua individuals um, as well. And so that was, that was really, really fascinating to see this again in this other analysis where essentially these Lysinida individuals show such a high degree of relatedness um, among all 21 populations, regardless of where the individuals were sampled. And of course you can see some variation in there um, but, but again, that's the, the predominant um, feature is that these are all very, very closely related genetically. And so um, from this work, basically, that's, that's basically what we found is that um, surprisingly, individuals are essentially genetically identical in this um, variety of exigua. And we actually think that Levenworthy exigua lysineata could be an apomict. And for anybody who might be unfamiliar, 
And apomict is um, the clonal propagation of via seed. So a maternal plant will produce clones of itself via seed. And there are a couple of different methods for that um, that I don't really have time to get into, but that's what we think might be going on um, with exigua varlis anita. That would be one explanation for why it's able to maintain high levels of fixed heterozygosity among individuals and all populations are identical. Um, and, and so that, that's what we think might be going on there. There are some um, instances of other plants in the Brassicaceae that are apomectic, um, as well as some diploid apomex, which we think this one, um, we do think it is diploid, but um, we've only done some preliminary analyses uh, that would give us more information on that. So there's more work to be done there, but right now that's that's our prediction is we think that Levomorthia exigua varlis anita is probably apomectic. So um, that kind of, that brings us back to this conservation genetics paradigm um, where we're concerned about small populations with low genetic diversity and how that uh, leads to the increased risk of extinction. And so whenever we assess genetic diversity in species that are typically characterized by low genetic diversity, it's almost like um, we're overlooking, we're, we're kind of knowingly overlooking potential alternative forms of biodiversity. Because if you are measuring something um, that you expect to be low already, there's, there's a chance that that may not be, you may not be maximizing what your, um, the diversity that you're capturing and what you're able to protect. And so um, it brings me back to this question that I have, which is are species with low genetic diversity doomed to extinction? because many species with limited or fixed genetic diversity display variation in traits, and some are very successful in a range of environmental conditions. Um, invasive plant species are a really good example of this because many display low genetic diversity, many are clonal or capable of self-realization, they often respond favorably to disturbance, and they can display extensive trait variation. So I point this out because it indicates that there are non-genetic forms of variation that can promote the persistence and survival of these genetically depauperate taxa. As we've seen, invasive species, they're invasive because they are excellent at invading and taking over, um, and yet they share a lot of the genetic characteristics of some of these rare and endangered species. So, you know, what, what's the difference there? So what about this non-genetic variation? One form of non-genetic variation is found in the epigenome, and this is a regulatory system of the genome that can alter gene expression without changing DNA sequence. And so one form of epigenomic variation um, that I'll just touch on today is DNA methylation. And what this is, is this is just the addition of a methyl group. It's a chemical modification to the cytosine nucleotide of DNA. Um, and this is completely natural. It's found in every branch of life, although it is not necessarily found in every single organism in every branch of life. Um, but it's one of the most well-studied forms of epigenomic variation. And so that was one reason we decided to focus on this. It's, it's a really um, tractable uh, form of variation uh, across the genome in order to measure. And so what do we know about DNA methylation of plants? Well, we know that DNA methylation can be heritable, environmentally sensitive, it can be linked to phenotypes and trait variation, and it can also be independent from genotype. We also know that it can play a role in shaping and generating genetic variation. And so it's a really, um, it's a really kind of complex but elegant system um, that we're just beginning to understand how it might contribute to additional forms of variation in living organisms. And so this brings us back to this conservation genetics paradigm again, and whether or not species with low genetic diversity are doomed to extinction. Um, and so we think that the conservation genetics paradigm needs an update where we look at also conservation epigenomics. And this is looking at epigenetic and epigenomic diversity as a form of non-heritable genetic or heritable non-genetic variation, environmental memory, and phenotypic plasticity. Um, that could actually act as a substrate for natural selection and produce adaptive responses and alleviate stress in these genetically depauperate systems to actually increase their chance of survival. Um, and so the goals then um, after that became in this potentially apomictic system um, to look at epigenetic and phenotypic variation. And so we did this because we wanted to understand how do phenotypic traits and patterns of epigenomic diversity vary among populations in the species, and do patterns of epigenomic variation correspond to patterns of phenotypic variation? 
as well, what are the implications of these studies for the conservation of this species? So this study um, I have here uh, that it included four species, three self-fertilizing and our putative apomict. I'm only, I only have time to just um, present a little bit of the results for um, our rare and endangered species. So that's what I'm going to focus on. But this was the overall um, study. We I sampled um, seed from the field and grew them in a greenhouse under two different conditions and recorded a bunch of traits and um, conducted quantitative genetics as well as uh, whole genome by cell by sequencing, which allowed me to measure DNA methylation. And so let's just, um, let's look at some results that get at both of these questions here. So first of all, patterns of epigenomic diversity. This is looking at DNA methylation differences genome-wide in the rare and endangered species, um, exigua varilaciniata. And each of the populations, there are three here, are indicated by um, the shape of the symbol. And then the colors indicate different maternal lines. And so what we see immediately is that individuals predominantly group by population. So we have all of our little circles or McNeely Park individuals down here, um, Sportsman's Club individuals, all the squares are here. And then um, the Pine Creek Barrens individuals are over here, the triangles. But they also seem to cluster by maternal line within population, which is fascinating because, again, these are all genetically identical. And you see that there's um, this blue ellipse here is really big. And whenever I dug into that, it looks like the, all of this variation is largely being driven by the single individual here. Um, I think there's something interesting going on there. But again, I'll, we'll have to save that for another time. Um, and so we also looked at patterns of phenotypic diversity. And what we found is, despite these individuals being genetically identical, we actually found significant variation in traits by population. And so that was also very curious because it doesn't, you know, you wouldn't expect if genetic diversity is the basis of trait diversity, then why are genetically individual, genetically different individuals, genetically identical individuals showing different um, patterns and trait variation. And so the possible conservation implications for this um, are based on genetic data to protect um, and collect seeds from the five populations that exhibit small mutations and at least one population that has dominant genotype to capture all geographically representative genetic diversity. Um, but in considering the epigenetic and phenotypic data, um, we would think that non-genetic variation could be an important source of biodiversity in the species. And targeting this diversity for conservation could actually expand the diversity being protected within it, which would boost its adaptive capacity and potentially promote its persistence. Um, there are some things that we still need to work out. We need to understand whether this epigenomic variation is heritable. Um, is DNA methylation the basis of that trait variation? And what environmental factors might this variation respond to? And so big picture, wrapping up here, limited genetic diversity does not equal a lack of biodiversity. Epigenetic and phenotypic variation could be especially important in genetically depauperous species as measuring genetic diversity alone in species is likely to underestimate intraspecific biodiversity overall. Thank you.